Good morning. Welcome to Open Aperio 2019. I'm Ian Dolphin, the Executive Director of the Aperio Foundation. Got a great program for you this year. A little bit of housekeeping first. PDF of the program is on the website or download the mobile app. That will let you know where you're going. Uh, remember, please, for security reasons, wear your name tag inside the hotel, but remember to take it off when you go out. So, a few opening remarks. First of all, it's customary on this occasion to remind ourselves of the mission of the foundation, which is to collaborate, to foster, develop, and sustain open technologies and innovation to support learning, teaching, and research. A square focus on helping institutions and other organizations deliver the academic mission. We're a membership organization. All our funding comes from membership dues. Legally, we're registered in New Jersey as a US-based nonprofit. Uh, no particular reason for that other than the fact that some lawyers from Princeton did pro bono work when we set ourselves up. We're a global organization, though. We have a footprint clearly in North America, but we have strong support in South Africa, in Europe, in Japan, and growing in Australia. We have an elected board of directors. The board are elected at the annual general meeting, which is this afternoon at 2.45 in Museum A. So if you're a voting representative or an individual member of a perio, please show up and show your support. We don't believe, as an organization, that we're going to deliver that mission alone, so we build close and effective partnerships with other organizations with similar missions or an overlapping mission. We have a partnership with the ASAP Portail Consortium in France. There's an opportunity to learn more about them in an ASAP-provided session at this conference. But I did want to make a note that a Perio software footprint is growing in France quite considerably. There are several large Karuta pilots. Karuta is being highly successful, and the national pilot using some of the Shahari Aperio analytics stack. We also have a partnership with LAMP, which is a consortium of small colleges in North America. Is Martin Ramsey in the room? Not quite just yet, by the look. So either that or the light shining so brightly I can't see him. Uh, when I say small colleges, I mean colleges that are 300 to 1,200 FTE. They collaborate to provide services like Sakai uh, in, as hosted services. Uh, and that, I think, is an interesting model that we're probably going to learn some more about over the next few days. So how we work, our educational institution members and our commercial affiliates contribute membership subscriptions and, of course, volunteer effort, which is really what Aperio is built around. And we provide a limited set of shared services, and supporting subscriptions support those of our software communities that use, uh, use money. We have grown quite considerably. 17 projects from a handful when we started out. I'll say a bit more about that in a moment. And they're just some of the areas that Aperio software either touch on or cover. Of course, the reason we do this work around open source software, which we recognize is not free from cost, but it's free from licensing cost, it means that if you spend on open source software, you're investing in institutional capacity and growing institutional capacity. And open source software is, of course, flexible and adaptable to a wide variety of institutional and other needs. What's the alternative? Well, the alternative is, quite frankly, that student debt pays for this. Ferris wheels and MC hammer. I don't necessarily think that's such a good use of student debt, personally. And if you look at the IPO of a leading educational software company, which will remain nameless for my purposes this morning, you will see how much is spent on sales, 52%. How much is spent on admin, 25%, and on R&D, 24%. More than twice as much on sales and marketing as R&D. And Ben Woodmuller, one of the founders of ELG, I noticed this quote from him the other week. I think it's particularly apposite to what we do. 
So in education, government, and anywhere primarily, primarily supported by public funding, it doesn't make sense to use software that doesn't lock you in or quietly convert public funds into private equity. So we've grown from a handful of software communities when we were formed to 17 software communities. We've established an incubation process which helps new projects turn from being really great ideas to being really great software products. We've graduated seven software communities from incubation in the first five years. We've strengthened old partnerships and we've built new partnerships. And we've begun over the course of the last year uh, a review uh, of our strategy and a refresh of our strategy. And as always, we seek to engage the community in that, the broader Perio community. Uh, if you're not a member of the open list, please go to the Aperio website and sign up for it. It means you can participate in those conversations. Some breaking news. Uh, is anyone from Cal Community College Tech Center in the room? Not yet. OK. Um, the board and the incubation working group recently admitted a new project to incubation. It's only just starting off. This news is literally a week old. It's a standalone assessment engine or tool set. Provisional name is Open Assessment. It's being supported by the California Community College Tech Center and Unicon. More info is coming soon, but there's a session on Tuesday at 2.45 in here if you want to find out more about it. And we'll be capturing that session and streaming it. So watch out for more news on that. It'll take a couple of weeks for a press release to uh, work its way through the system, I think. And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Tanis Morgan. Uh, Tanis is director of the Center for Teaching, Learning, and Innovation at the Justice Institute of British Columbia. She's a key champion of open educational resources and open source software at the Justice Institute. Active with BC Campus, an agency supporting post-secondary education in British Columbia, and last year won the BC Campus Award for Excellence in Open Education. So please join me in welcoming our first keynote, Tanis Morgan. to the beginning. Um, thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. I have to point out that that photo was actually about three year, years old, and I actually am not updating my photo anymore. I'm at that age, so it stays as is. I am um, very pleased to be here. I want to draw your attention to the hashtag Aperio19 if you're following along on Twitter, um, or intend to tweet during the keynote. And it's really a great pleasure to be here today, not only because I'm actually a big fan of Aperio and open source um, educational technology, but also because I understand what it is to have the privilege of being a keynote at an event like this. And this is my first time at Aperio, so I thought it might be um, important to tell you a few things about me. So I am actually an accidental technologist. I am the mom of a teen and two preteens, so you may have to pray for me for the next five years or so. Um, I am a mountain biker, but I recently saw myself on um, video and I realized that I am incredibly slow, even though I feel like I'm super fast. I am a former Ultimate Frisbee player, and I'm also a romance novel fan, and I'd like to thank um, Smart Bitches Trashy Books for not making me feel bad about that. We are a big community out there. I am a sometimes painter, and I'm also a Vancouverite. And importantly, I want to draw your attention to um, the Fem Ed Tech community, of which I am also a member. You can follow them on Twitter as well. And they've been doing some really amazing work in bringing um, critical feminist perspectives to educational technology, which, in my opinion and that of many others, is so needed right now. So this year, um, I've actually been on secondment to BC campus as a researcher in open education practices. 
And they've been generously supporting the research I've been doing, which is really looking at how institutions in our sector in British Columbia are getting to open, what are the enabling factors, and um, also looking a little bit, supporting my research to some extent on looking at open source educational technology as one of those important enabling factors. So I'm really grateful to them for that. It's been a wonderful year. And it's probably a good time to explain to you a little bit what open education practices actually is, because I'm going to be talking a lot about it today. Um, I consider the broad, there's a broad ecosystem of open, of which open source is one thing. Um, I work primarily in open education. In open education, you'll hear us talk about quite a bit. You'll hear about open textbooks, which some of you may have initiatives already um, in your institutions or your states, um, which are basically textbooks that have been funded to um, be published and licensed free using a Creative Commons license. And this is really getting at um, the student debt issue that um, maybe is less of an issue in Canada for students, but one nonetheless where students are actually spending about $1,000 to $1,500 a semester on textbooks that is really going into the pockets of textbook publishers. Um, and we are looking at, well, we've got a big initiative that's um, trying to shift that, which I'll talk more about in a bit. Open education resources are teaching and learning and research materials that reside in the public domain, again, usually with um, Creative Commons licenses. And open pedagogy is really about the sharing of teaching and learning practices as well. So these are sort of the three areas that I'm thinking, I'm talking about when I say open education practices. And you may hear me say OEP, which is really the much easier version of um, talking about that. So as, as Ian mentioned, I've spent the last 10 years in senior administration at the Justice Institute of BC. It's a small college. It's very niche focused. Um, British Columbia is BC, in case you're wondering. And um, I'm the director of the Center for Teaching, Learning, and Innovation. But what that means is I'm responsible for the ed tech strategy and the innovation strategy. So that's really what I do. And today, I'd really like to talk about how open ed tech infrastructures need to be part of our institutions if we care about open education practices and ethical ed tech futures. So I'm aware that I'm speaking to an audience of uh, IT specialists, educational technologists, administrators working with open source technology. Um, and some of what I talk about today may already be old news, but I'm really hoping that it underlines, if it is old news, that it underlines the importance of the work that you're doing. In BC, it's customary for us to begin with territorial acknowledgements, and I would like to acknowledge that the land that I, on which I work and live in British Columbia, and specifically Vancouver, is the unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples, and specifically the Squamish, the Tsleil-Waututh, and the Musqueam First Nations. And through this excellent resource, um, it's a really fun resource to go to actually, nativeland.ca, um, you can learn what particular geographic area um, on which traditional territory it actually sits. I did learn that Los Angeles is um, the tr traditional territory of the Gabrielino Tongva peoples. And um, there's, there's all kinds of interesting um, resources produced by UCLA that can tell you more about those, um, the people that live in LA that are indigenous. So what's interesting about territorial acknowledgements is they're not just a thing that we do at the beginning of presentations and events. They're really designed to help us reflect on colonization and the harmful effects of that. And they also provide us with the opportunity to reflect on our histories and the erasure of those histories. So my work being at the intersection of ed tech innovation and um, open education um, took me on this journey a few years ago. I became very interested in the histories of those fields. And in particular, I became really interested in the time period between the 1960s and the 1980s, approximately. And I guess you could say I'm at that age where new things started to sound like old things. And I just wanted to always kind of check my assumptions about that. So it took, I went into the old academic journals, and I looked up with these keywords what, um, what was happening in the 60s and mostly the 70s. And it took me on a really fascinating journey. I'd like to share a couple examples with you. This is my personal favorite. <laughs> um, it comes from an article called Radical Innovation in a Conventional Framework, Problems and Prospects. And this one dates from 1977. Next, we have the familiar trope of disruption, but 1960s style. Um, and this one comes from... Uh, Innovation Processes and Practice and Prospects, and it dates from 1967. 
And finally, the last one is probably the most relevant for the topic of this presentation today. This one's from an article called Technology and Education, Who Controls? And it's from 1970. So finding so many familiar tropes in the research, in the literature of 1960s and 70s left me with some questions. How do we move towards new ideas without using the past as a check and balance? And of course, this is something, if you're familiar with the work of Audrey Waters, this is something that she um, has been an important critic of. And she invoked this idea of zombie ideas, that basically if you can never really get rid of them unless you slay them. And she's particularly critical of vendors and entrepreneurs who are actually um, very ignorant, is her word, about the history of ed tech. But they're producing all kinds of new things in, um, with ignorance to the, the past and the mistakes that maybe we've made. So when I called this presentation, The Future of Ed Tech and Higher Ed, when open source is a radical solution, um, I'll admit it was a bit tongue in cheek, because for me, the biggest innovation to happen to um, higher education actually isn't ed tech at all. It is the creation of the open university, open university system in the late 60s in um, the UK. And you may not know that Canada, between 1970 and 1978, created three open universities. Um, that still exist today and function quite well. And I'll share with you here um, the goals behind one of them, TELUC, which is the Université du Québec, which is Canada's French university. And these goals were articulated in 1972. So you can see that they're, I mean, it's an incredible list and it's um, quite ambitious. And what's interesting is that it took advantage of a new structure, the open university, and to, to shift towards a future that was more aligned with the social justice ambitions of its time. And um, one of these ambitions, I think, accessibility, meant that the open university was available for everybody, and that included gender, race, and ability. So it's quite um, astonishing, really, when you think, when you compare what we call innovation nowadays. <laughs> And today, I'll just point out that today the, uh, at TELUC, 70% um, of the enrollments are women, and approximately 50% would not be attending the University of TELUC wasn't an option. So quite an impact in terms of um, Quebec higher education. And I also mentioned that um, of the 10 most enrolled universities in the world, four of them are actually open universities. And in Indira Gandhi University, I mean, it's phenomenal. They have 35 million students that are enrolled. So you can see that the impact of this new structure in terms of accessibility is quite profound. I almost don't believe that 35 million. Like, I really had to check and see whether that was accurate. So um, I'm hoping it's at least, I'm hoping it's 80% accurate at, at least, because <laughs> it's astonishing, really. The population of Canada is 40 million people. So it's, it's, it's a scale that I just can't understand almost. So the importance of new or alternate structures guided by social justice um, ambitions and frameworks is actually the point of my presentation today. But first I'd like to share some stories about um, current realities that I call EdTech absurdities. And as the pers person responsible for the EdTech strategy at my institution, I have the dubious pleasure of being the primary contact for many vendors. Um, so let me just share with you. Um, about two years ago, one of our most boring, but nonetheless important ed tech tools was being upgraded. And the vendor wanted us to move from their full feature, move to their full featured cloud version um, from our self-hosted version, which would no longer have the same um, features. And BC student data privacy laws at the time used to be quite strict. And the, the option of moving to a US cloud actually wasn't an option at all. But as you can see from this um, short email excerpt, the core features that we needed would no longer be included in the self-hosted version, unless, of course, we were willing to find 120,000 US dollars, which actually translates to about 200,000 Canadian dollars. Um, and we wanted to sponsor its development. So of course, this was um, incredibly absurd. This was my response. Um, and I mean, I admit it was a bit of an exaggeration, but it really felt like it was a moment where there needed to be some pushback and a bit of a reality check and that, you know, an institution like ours really had a role in pushing back on this um, with either truth or fiction. And it's not entirely fiction, I'll get into that later. But it is kind of absurd to think that, you know, we as a client would be developing out a tool for them so that they can sell it back to us and to all these other institutions as well. I mean, I, I just don't see how that was a value add. The second example is I'll call ABC Software. So this is um, 
it, my institution uses this piece of software. It costs about $30,000 a year, which is significant for us um, in license fees. It, that's, it works out to about $100 per student. I think that's a lot of money. Um, and the last time I looked into this, it really wasn't a very well-loved tool. Like, people complained about it, but there were no other viable options, so you just sort of live with it. And incidentally, this tool, when I looked into it, was being used in the same kind of pro program across um, Canada at about 10 different institutions at the time. It's probably more now. And it, I wondered whether it was naive to think, you know, is it possible for us to get together and just pool our resources and create a tool perhaps, that we all like? Um, and maybe we, this tool could be open source so many people can use it and we can build a community around it, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, this is, this is the kind of thing that you're very familiar with. And of course, the inevitable response um, to this sometimes I uh, hear is, well, higher ed isn't in the job of building software, creating software. They can't support it. They don't have capacity, that sort of thing. But of course, this simply isn't um, true because if you've heard of WebCT, um, that's probably the most famous Canadian example. It was developed by a professor at UBC in the late 90s. Um, and eventually, and for years, actually, when I worked at UBC, we actually were able to use it for free because it had been created at, Web at UBC. But then when it got bought by Blackboard, it, the whole um, story changed there. And I'll mention that at my own very small, low-resource institution, we have also created a fantastic piece of software called Praxis. But this leads me to my third ed tech absurdity. Um, we created Praxis because there were no other options available at the time for scenario-based learning, specifically synchronous scenario-based learning. And scenario-based learning is something that, it's a learning methodology that we actually use primarily at the Justice Institute. And um, we really didn't want to get into the software game at all, but we actually really needed a tool, this tool for a variety of reasons. So here's a sidebar. When I'm regularly courted by EdTech vendors, I have told them repeatedly that we would love to use their tools if only they would create the ones that we actually need. And very sincerely, the last time an LMS vendor came to the JI, I actually took them on a tour of our experiential learning spaces. I talked about our experiential learning model, talked about the kinds of things that we needed, the kinds of tools that we needed. And they were very polite. They listened politely. Um, and I told them, you know, we don't really need that ePortfolio tool that you keep telling us about. But of course, the next time they got in touch, they talked to us. They wanted to talk to us about their ePortfolio tool. So I really did try. <laughs> But the important thing to underline here is we created Praxis with public funds, mainly from one large federal grant. And without getting into too much detail as to why we didn't release that open source, um, basically the situation is, is that only us can use it unless you want to pay us for a license. Um, and there's nobody else in the public sector that can use it. And that's important because not only higher education has a need for this tool, but actually industry as well. We're thinking like Air Canada, um, defense, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of potential applications for this tool and potential impact. So when I came across this article by Chris Jones, um, I mean, this really resonated. But I was also reminded of one of academia's biggest absurdities. Does anybody want to get guess what that is? OK, it's early. Oh, someone does? Is there a hand? No, there isn't. OK, yes. Yes! <laughs> I mean, that is, that is probably um, the biggest one that still baffles my mind. So to summarize, Publicly funded researchers conduct research using public funds. They write up this research. They send it to ac um, not publicly funded, basically for-profit academic publishers who then take their free labor and publish it. And then they sell it back to academic public, publicly funded academic libraries for exorbitant fees. And it is astonishing to me that an entire sector of exceedingly smart people bought into the system and let it flourish as a status quo for years. But of course, even powerful entities like academic publishing don't need to be our status quo. And this is a good time to talk about the Public Knowledge Project, which began in 1998. It's another Vancouver UBC um, project. And it was um, created as a move to shift the unreciprocal world of academic um, publishing. And as part of the PKP, they created a system called the Open Journal Systems, which you may be familiar with. And what's interesting is that today there are approximately 10,000 mostly open journals that use the OGS system. And this is up from about 400 in 2000. So there's been really substantial growth in this area. And I'll also point out that in 2003, the Doge was created, which I think signals that in the space of about five years, there actually was a need for a directory of open access journals. 
So I think it's fair to say that this has absolutely shifted academic publishing. In fact, if you do follow that world, you will see all kinds of antics that academic publishers are engaging right now to um, open wash the open movement, as we like to call it, um, and really um, actively changing their game. So a success story of some, of some respects. The second example I'll use is the BC Campus Pressbook Service. So in 2015, BC Campus, which is a large, um, well not large, it's a government agency that works under the Minister of Advanced Education in British Columbia. They fund you know, higher education in our province. And they began a, um, an initiative aimed at creating a collection of open textbooks um, for students in BC post-secondaries. And this collection sits on a BC Campus um, service called a Pressbook Service. And if an institution like my own creates an open textbook, we can have it hosted by BC Campus in their curated, peer-reviewed collection. And you know, this, this has had worldwide attention. Everybody who knows about the BC Campus Pressbook service. So it's been very successful. And the impact of this has been that in, since 2015, more than $10 million in student textbook savings have been recorded. Um, and there's probably many more. There are 276 um, textbooks in this collection following, you know, crossing a range of disciplines. Um, and only 60 of these have actually been funded with BC campus money. So there's been a lot of momentum that's been created even without BC campus money. Now, it's incredible if you, if you consider that 10 million savings when you consider that BC is a, has a population of 4 million people. And, um, and I think in order to understand this impact, you really have to imagine what, it would, what would have happened if, if the Pressbook Service didn't exist for the 25 um, post-secondary institutions in our province. And I can think of two scenarios. The first one being, well, I'm getting a little weird alert here. Um, oh, something's popping up from your computer. <laughs> It's okay. It's on the screen. Um, the first one being that institutions would most likely host their own textbooks. These would end up in the LMS. Nobody outside the, the, cor the course or maybe at best the institution would ever know they existed. Um, they would just be sort of hidden in this LMS. Larger institutions with IT resources could probably set up their own pressbook service, but the smaller institutions, of which are the majority in my province, would never get their IT departments to agree to do that. They just, they just couldn't add one more thing. So basically, I don't think we'd have the same impact. And in fact, when, um, with the BC Campus Pressbooks example, what's really interesting, and again, this is probably one of those things that's not news to you, but the BC Campus programmers were actually able to work with this open source um, tool to develop it out to be a suitable tool for open textbook publishing and contribute back that code. So they actually work really closely right now with, BC, with Pressbooks, which is based in Montreal. And it's really, I think, an example of educators driving the development of technology to meet the needs of educators versus the needs of a corporation. And that's really important for us, as you've seen in the previous example, where um, basically you, otherwise you end up creating your, your own tools. So it's important to talk about this in the context of open education, because increasingly, I don't think you can have open or open education practices without open ed tech infrastructure. And this might be glaringly obvious, but actually, I think there's, it's, it's not really talked about very much. And hopefully, these two instances will sort of you know, show to the degree to which that is important. But specifically, as my colleague Jim Luke says, open by license, closed by process, pra practice. Right? And this is actually a contentious point in open education right now because, of course, open education as a movement has a, gained a lot of attention, especially the textbook publishers. And what's happening now is vendors are coming in <laughs> and they're wrapping OER and they're providing all these value add services on top of it. And, and proponents will say, you know, that's absolutely okay. You know, we wouldn't have been able to do that. We wouldn't have been able to take advantage of OER without these um, vendors coming in and helping us. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's an important perspective to consider for sure. But I think now it's glaringly obvious that, you know, it really isn't about providing us with services. <laughs> um, when I see a graph like this that looks, that tells us, you know, a little bit more about the ed tech companies with the most student data, you know, I have, I, you know, I wonder what game I'm in here. And it raises some questions for me. So first of all, why, why do the vendors want student data? Like, what are they doing with it? Why does everything seem to be about data? You know, um, does the value proposition for the student or the institution of, you know, these promised student, these student anal learning, learning analytics products, you know, personalized learning, et cetera, does it balance with what the vendor actually gains? 
And these are questions that, if I'm perfectly honest, I couldn't really answer in an informed way. Am I getting an echo there? Is that good? So I actually asked some of my ed tech colleagues who are leaders at their institution, and um, of course they were able to tell me a little bit more about this because um, while they've been paying attention to the much bigger picture of what's happening out here, I was naively focused on the affordances of ed tech for teaching and learning and open education. And certainly I think this is especially evident when you um, see the emergence of digital platforms whose business models essentially are to grow and scale infinitely and monetize and profit infinitely. Um, and LinkedIn is probably the most um, relevant example for higher education because basically what it's doing is it, this alternative credentialing platform that they're creating through their um, merger plays really well into a narrative of higher ed that, you know, we're not producing graduates that are, you know, coming out with the right skills, they're not job ready. Um, institutions can't move fast enough to keep up in this, you know, fast changing world of digital. So it completely moves in and um, into that space that's opened up. And this is really laid out quite nicely in um, an article by Ben Win Williamson about unbundling higher education, which simply put, you know, when higher ed is unbundled, it creates again another space for a platform university where students are the raw material for the monetization. And so importantly, I think what Williamson points out is that we're actually becoming complicit actors in this as well. And I think that's something, again, that ed tech leaders and senior leaders at our institutions really need to be aware of, because I think this um, implicates them in a really not favorable way. And of course, the question about why do they care so much about the student data, when you see that, really, turn it in, it was, I mean, we all have this on our radar, but $1 billion? I mean, it sold for over a billion dollars. But I think it says something about the value of that data, and it certainly asks the questions, you know, if Advance, um, it, which is a privately held media communications and tech firm, is, um, you know, spending a billion dollars in that, is this an equal transaction really for higher education? And uh, I don't think so. So Amazon Web Services has recently moved into Canada, and it brings with it a whole array of ed tech companies that sit on Amazon Web Services. Um, that were previously actually, until recently, unable to operate in Canada due to our data privacy laws. And um, the question for me then becomes, will Amazon Web Services become the de facto infrastructure on which higher ed and government actually sit? And the government part is really the part that worries me in that situation, as well as the higher ed. So you can see here that, um, again, when you consider that Canada is 40 million people. It's really not a big market for Amazon, I think. So it certainly raises some questions. And they give some hints of this ambition here um, in terms of bundling pu public sector, higher education, and nonprofit together. And there's, again, they're talking here about addressing the skills gap. So there's that word again, partnership with um, Pearson VU, or VU, or however you say that. And importantly, providing training to 200,000 government employees through um, AWS DigiGov program. I have no idea what that means, but it raises some flags for me. And just to verify that I'm not a complete conspiracy theorist, there's an excellent article by Michael Quet this year where really he lays that all out um, and certainly points out that big data is a little more than a euphemism for surveillance. So yeah, I'm worried. <laughs> so <laughs> this is probably a nice time to take a cute puppy time out. Um, <laughs> I'm going to have a sip of water, <laughs> and they are adorable, aren't they? Um, I'm a pug person myself, but I had to put this one up here. So okay, let's bring it back to the level of an administrator working at a small, publicly funded institution. So there's no doubt that Amazon Web Services would make my life a lot easier and also that of my IT department, hands down, absolutely. But of course, I wonder about the value of what is being sold versus what is being extracted. And the other piece I have about this is like, who has the resources in their institutions to actually take advantage of all this data that these systems are providing us? Certainly in my institution, we probably have two people who actually have the skills and who have this in their job description, and they're incredibly busy. So I don't think it's really realistic to think that that's even something we can exercise. Who has, uh, sorry, do students really care about this? Like our students work 10 to 30 hours a week while um, maintaining full-time employment. Like they're, they're pretty much adult learners, so they're really busy. Um, and we also know from our research that they actually care about, the two things they care about are the experiential learning opportunities and their instructors. So um, they're not really asking for 
personalized learning a whole lot. The other question I have is how much of our institutional budget should even be going to tech and even ed tech for that matter in a race to sort of stay innovative and current, you know, and, and not be left behind? And I wonder, certainly in the case of what's happening right now, and maybe this is happening in other places, but we have a bit of a mental health crisis with a lot of our students and a lot of our youth. Um, and I wonder whether we should start talking more about redirecting dollars towards mental health supports or other kinds of academic support, for example, writing or whatever it might be um, for students. And that might be glaringly obvious, but um, I do want to ask the question, you know, how do we feel about our public dollars going to fund enormous marketing budgets? that sell us their products. And when I'm, when I'm at my institution trying to scrape, you know, trying to find a way to save $30,000 on a piece of software, and I see things like this, I mean, it's just like, oh, okay, this is, this, this is really, um, we're at a different scale here. So aside from the data extraction implications, um, there's other reasons why I think we need to pay more attention to including open source ed tech as part of our ed tech infrastructures. And when the new acronym NGDLE, which is really hard to roll off the tongue, Next Generation Digital Learning Environment, um, when it dropped, I was, I was really struggling to find out how this particular technology-mediated vision of the future was going to be important for my institution. Like, it really, it, was, it just seemed like, yeah, it's, not, it's probably not going to happen. And I think Anne-Marie Scott points this out really well in a critique that she has on her blog you know, that it's really a fetishization of technology without thinking about the broader, you know, application of digital. And when this happened, I think this came out in, I think the NGDLE was about a 2015 kind of announcement. I, mean, I can't remember correctly. But at GIBC, we'd already expanded beyond our LMS for everything vision that, you know, we were being told was the way to go. And we'd begun developing um, most of our courses in um, WordPress. And we had an in-house scenario-based learning tool that I told you about. And with two, together with two other colleagues, Brian Lamb and Grant Potter, we'd begun discussions that would lead us to the Open ETC. And the Open ETC stands for the Open EdTech Cooperative or Open EdTech Collaborative. Um, we like to say that the Open ETC runs on contributions, not contracts. So it's not a shared service. It's a shared contribution model that is very much guided by cooperative principles and um, platform cooperativism. So we have a service, basically, even though I said it's not a service, but we have a service that's available to all the post-secondary institutions, all 25 in BC. Um, they're whitelisted into it. Their faculty and students can go in. And this is what we offer. So we have a WordPress service. Well, this has one, been one of the most contentious things for institutions to get their IT departments to support is WordPress. So we created a WordPress, an extra institutional WordPress service that sits for higher ed. And um, right now we have 600 registered users on this across nine post-secondary institutions. And it's mainly actually being used right now for e-portfolios. So we have templates that can be cloned very easily using NS Cloner. Um, they can be customized, and those customizations can also be cloned very easily. And um, this has become a really interesting e-portfolio tool in our province. We also have an open source slot called Mattermost. We also host the WordPress community of practice for the province. Um, on Mattermost as well. And we also have recent integration with Big Boo Button in that as well. And my personal favorite is Sandstorm. We have a Sandstorm um, section where, if you're not familiar with it, it's a whole suite of open source apps um, ranging from you know, project management, file sharing, there's Etherpad in there, there's um, Rocket Chat, all kinds of things, um, Draw.io, and basically, um, you can, and a faculty member can go in and with one click install it and have access to that right away. And for me, that's incredibly powerful. They don't have to create a business case or put in a service ticket to IT, right? Like that's, that's a lot. Um, so this is what I think we're doing with the Open ETC. You know, we're encouraging this technolo technology autonomy. We're trying to lower the barrier to participation in open source ed tech. Um, we're trying to provide a more sustainable ed tech infrastructure in our province. I mean, there's, it's just simply not possible for each institution to try and do this individually. And we're also trying to assist BC faculty in evaluating and making informed pedagogical decisions about open source teaching and um, open source ed tech. Because really, without it, there's no way for them to even begin to try and explore that. And so maybe this doesn't technically fit under the rubric of an NGDLE, but I think um, 
I think it does address, you know, some things that um, Clint Lalonde points out in his critique of the NGLE, which is basically, you know, it, it, at least it gives us a vision of ed tech that isn't completely vendor driven. And also think that what it's doing is, is really creating, it sees open source um, as an opportunity and a set of affordances that vendors actually can't provide. Um, this is also from an Educause article. And finally, it's a step towards what Anne-Marie Scott calls pop-up ed tech, which I just love this idea, this pop-up ed tech idea, where you can e very easily swing up a suite of small, simple, lightly managed tools, and these are actually designed to self-destruct. So they're only available for a little while, and then they just go away, and you don't have to um, worry about them lasting for 10 years, supporting them for infinite m amounts of time. And I think this is really important because for me, the Sandstorm instance is a really great example of, of what I call EdTech IKEA. It's very light, it's very easy to um, get up and running with, you know, and it's very specific for a specific small teaching and learning activity. It's not meant to be enterprise. And um, I think that's really important when you're looking and talking with faculty who really just don't, they don't really have the, the mental um, energy on top of everything else, to learn new tools and to navigate institutional structures in order to actually get the tools that they need to do their teaching and learning. Importantly, I think um, OpenETC addresses a problem that smaller or lesser resource institutions are facing, which is how do you shift from the convenience of a vendor-controlled ed tech infrastructure to an open source infrastructure? And importantly, I also think that um, you know, it, again, it's, it's really important for our institutions to be aware of other options like Aperio, like OpenETC, like Reclaim Hosting and Domains of One Own. Um, and I d really don't feel like we know enough about it in our province. I will say that I don't think Aperio is well known at all, um, and hopefully they will be in the future. But if our higher ed leaders and our government need to really um, have a model or really see how this can actually work, I think that they need to go and visit the ESAP Portai folks um, and really learn more about how higher ed in France is, is very well organized in terms of open education, OER, open ed tech infrastructure. I mean, those are really um, fantastic models. So two weeks ago, I was at a conference um, held at Simon Fraser University called Digital Democracies. Sophia Noble, who wrote the book um, Algorithm, Algorithms of Oppression, was there. And she really um, provoked us to think about big tech as big tobacco. And her point there was that, you know, it's not enough to have a conversation about big tech in terms of ethical things, eth ethical ed tech. She said, you know, we really have to talk more about the structures around that. And she urged us to see um, our institutions as places of resistance for this, as a check and balance to big tech. You know, underlining the point that this does not need to be ine inevitable. We can be, you know, sites of resistance. But of course, so I was incredibly jazzed by this. I thought, well, that's a really hopeful message. But unfortunately, a week later, I came across this um, megapixels.cc site where, if you haven't seen it yet, it's, it surfaces how two universities in the U.S. Um, were actually collecting photos from cameras placed in public areas on campus um, for the purposes of developing um, facial recognition for surveillance technologies. And um, students un were unaware and unconsenting. So there's a whole bunch level, there's a whole bunch of egregious sort of things going on in here. And it led me to think, you know, so if we're supposed to be sites of resistance, but we're not, we're actually complicit, you know, who are, wh where is the resistance to this? Is it CrossFit headquarters? <laughs> Or is it um, this guy who, who's a programmer who created an algorithm to create makeup that tricks facial recognition? Yeah, you know, pretty great, right? Um, I learned a lot about masks and all kinds of things this week. Um, so what is the future then? You know, if this is really what we are, the environment or the mud that we're in, I think it's more like mud. I look increasingly to the work of some University of Cape Town colleagues, Laura Chernovich, Cheryl Hodgkinson-Williams, and Henry Trotter, who've really, in the open education world, have really asked us or shown us the way that how with social justice frameworks, we can actually take, we have a lens and ability to um, critique our actions or critique our, um, our work and guide our work. 
And in this article here, um, Laura makes a really great case for that in terms of, she's speaking here in the African context, but um, really what we need is some new policy and regulatory frameworks that you know, need to help us with that. And actually this message that she has in this article is actually incredibly hopeful. It's not, a, it's not a downer kind of a thing, so let's just keep going with the uplifting. Social justice frameworks can be really important, we, but we are at a point where we need to ground it in something. Even open education is just not grounded enough. Um, we're too busy talking about all the great things that we're doing. I think we can also celebrate and agree that open education practices and open source tech is a really nice marriage. And um, given what we know about vendor-driven infrastructure, um, I think we need to know now that it's really incompatible. If you want to do OEP, you cannot, it, it seems incompatible with vendor ed tech. There's some examples too that we have. We had a project with the University of Guadalajara, a faculty development um, project where we actually used open source ed tech um, from other projects, open projects like DS106, if you're familiar with that, to create basically a new model for doing faculty, faculty development that sits on a new kind of um, configuration of open source tech combined with more popular tools. And I have to give a shout out to Alan Levine here, who was the architect of this for us. I see more and more um, really interesting wiki projects that are clearly changing the world. And I think the point there is that you know, we can really engage in meaningful activities um, with open OEP and open ed tech when you have those two things come together, um, whose knowledge is um, a fantastic um, resource to take a look at, um, as is the work that the Wikimedian in residence at University of Edinburgh is doing. And finally, I mean, I, I feel like some institutions are doing the right thing. This announcement by Carnegie Mellon that they were going to give away their or open source their digital learning software tools, I mean, that's fantastic. I mean, this is, this is the kind of thing that small institutions, they, if we don't want to create our own, we really need these kinds of um, things to happen. And finally, I think these universities like University of Leeds and University of Edinburgh are really diving into um, policy and guidelines around ethical learning analytics at their institution. Interestingly and helpfully, they've made these creative commons so that this effort can be um, replicated elsewhere um, around the world, which again is, um, I mean, this, is, this stuff is tricky to navigate and you have to have the time and resources to actually even go down this path. Um, I'd like to jump to just some of the things that I'm seeing in the program um, here at Aperio, this conference. And I have to say that a lot of the work that you're doing makes me very hopeful as well. When I see OpenCast that's um, being used at a very large scale, when I see ideas like ELMS, which I have to admit I still need to dig into quite a bit more, Karuda, I mean there's so many possibilities and I think that work is just so important. And I'm excited to learn more about it. But I'd like to thank Amanda Coolidge at BC Campus for pointing out that critiques and discussions of these kinds of issues really need next steps. And there's a big so what if there's no action. So in look, I'm looking towards a liberating structure that really helps you focus on um, looking at the 15% that you can do to, to sort of not put all your energy worrying about the stuff that you can't do. So here's my 15%, I'm going to share it with you. Um, I'm really interested in the work of this ethical ed tech group, which is um, Aaron Glass and Nathan Schneider. And I think they have some really great questions that could be used as a decision framework for conversations at my institution, in particular with educational leaders. Um, for example, is, is whatever we're looking at, is it closed or is it open? Does it give us more control or less control? What's the privacy implication? Who owns the infrastructure? Who owns the data? I think these are really simple starting point kinds of questions. And this is where we are at. Um, I think in our province with our institutions. This is where we need to start. Oh, that's interesting. That completely, uh, sorry, I'm just like looking at this going, that was not the picture that was there. <laughs> that's an interesting um, pause there. Okay, so my 15% is to certainly help institutional leadership be more educated and informed about what's at stake. I want to make our ed tech um, principles and policies upfront and transparent. And I would like vendors to show us how they meet those principles. And certainly, um, Paul Stacey's, if you haven't seen it, it's linked into these slides, he has an excellent guide for vendor participation in open education. It's basically a rubric that could be used for um, when looking at procurement. Um, super helpful. 
I'm going to look at restructuring my budget so that I have a more systematic process of supporting open source tech and the people who work with it, people like Alan Levine who um, do the, a lot of the stuff off the side of their desk for free. And finally, um, I'm more, with FemEd Tech, I look to this community to surface important voices that don't often get heard, in particular women, people of color, and those from the periphery or the global south. Um, and participate in lifting those voices. Because quite honestly, we still encounter mantles, all male keynotes, and our ed tech spaces in academia are incredibly white. So we're pretty good now at acknowledging this, but we're not doing enough to shift it. And the danger of that is so well pointed out by people like Sofia Noble and um, Carolyn Criado Perez, who wrote Invisible Women, um, and others who, you know, they've been exposing this. and. The, in essence, the white male-dominated um, tech industry of big tech hurts us all, and I think it's important for us to participate in shifting that towards a more equitable future, because we're certainly feeling it. And with that in mind, I would like to give a shout out to the wall, gratitude, gratitude to um, some of my fem ed tech allies who inspire me like really every day. So we've walked through some examples of ed tech absurdities, um, we've t dove into the importance of institutional control, privacy, surveillance, etc. We've talked about alternative visions of the NGDLE. So I'd like to leave you today with this. If open source is the radical solution to the vendor-driven, extracted, dictated to us future of what we're being sold, what is the 15% that you can do and you can address at your institution in your role? And with that, I would like to say thank you. And that's it. Goodbye. <laughs>